there! Well, we're really excited to be bringing you this lesson because we'll be creating this handsome looking pterosaur with polymer clay. But before we get into it, if you love art and would like to see more art lessons, log on to our website at www.montmart.net. We also have links to our Facebook and Instagram pages and to our art club, The Creative Connection. So let's start sculpting. were flying reptiles and were in fact the first invertebrates to fly. To sculpt one you need to get as much relevant information and images as you can. Most importantly some good skeletal reference. I like to draw up what I'm going to sculpt in at least the front and side elevation so I can work out how I'm going to construct the armature. This particular pterosaur model depicts the largest species of them all, the Quetzalcoatlus. Quetzalcoatlus stood as tall as a giraffe, had a 15 metre wingspan and a head the size of a car. Now we have our elevation drawings, we can work out a logical armature and fixing points. For tools for the armature, I'll be using a drill with a 1 16th bit, two flat nose pliers, two 1 16th booker rods, two wire coat hangers, some tie wire, washers, spring washers and nuts, scissors and a traditional wooden pallet. I take the armature sheet and cut out the template of the fixing points. I then tape it into position onto a wooden pallet and drill the holes. Once I have all of the holes drilled, I number the holes and mark the front to avoid any confusion. The next step is to fix the booker rods to the pallet. Take a full booker rod and thread on a nut spring washer and then the washer about 100mm up. Thread the rod through the hole and then follow the same process from the other side. Once the fasteners are in position, nip them up with your fingers and then tighten them with a pair of pliers for each nut. Ensure the rod is fastened nice and tight as you don't want the armature coming loose as you get further into the project. Observe the plan and elevation drawings to see at what angle to bend the rod. Once the rod has been angled, measure the rod cutoff point. Mark it with blue tack, then cut in the appropriate spot. The best way to make a clean break is to create an indentation with the cutting part of the pliers and bend it until it breaks. Repeat the process for the existing rods. The rods have been fixed to the base now and we can fashion the legs and arm parts of the armature. Use a wire coat hanger for this. Cut the hook part off and straighten the hanger out. Wire coat hangers are the perfect gauge as they are thicker than tie wire so they will hold shape but are very easy to bend. Use the plan as a guide and make the bends in the appropriate positions. For right angle bends, it's best to use pliers, but smooth bends can easily be made by hand. Once the legs have been created, the arms can be created in the same way. Take note of how much larger the arms are than the legs, as this has a bearing on the animal's stance. Also take note of the side elevation, where the arms bend and the position of the shoulders as the shoulder from arm 1 is lower and behind the shoulder from arm 2. Use sellotape to hold the legs into position and then use tie wire to bind the legs onto the booker rod. Tie the leg wire onto the rods as tightly as you can as again you don't want the legs loosening inside the sculpture. A sound armature is very important with these realistic fine sculptures. And just like a skeleton, take all the weight. A strong armature allows you to be robust in your sculpting when it comes to adding clay and it allows you to turn the sculpture upside down to easily access the underside of the work. The front legs are attached in the same way but I don't cut off the ends. Instead, I tie them off as they will be the supports for our pterosaur's wingtips. The next step is to fashion the spine. Again, use more wire from the coat hanger and roughly follow the form on the plan. Don't trim this to size until it is attached to the legs and arms. Okay, now we've got the backbone made up. We just put two little bits of blue tack to hold it into position, apply it to the rest of the armature, and then I've pre-made up these tie wires. You just wrap the tie wire around and connect it to the rest of the armature and then we can reinforce it with more tie wire. 
use two ties on each point and cross them diagonally over each join. Neatly snip off the wire and then bend more wire around the whole armature. I've not shown a lot of the footage of this step, but the more wire used, the better I think. Once all the additional tie wire is bound onto the armature, I refine the position of the neck until I'm happy with how it sits. I snip off the spine at the correct spot and place in the head support. I use more wire to bind it secure and snip it off at the front and at the rear. So now that our armature is finished, the next step is to pack our sculpture out with aluminium foil. So let's get this on. Pterosaurs were fairly lithe creatures in general, so we don't need a lot of aluminium foil. We just need to ensure that the outer shell of clay sits at a thickness of about 6mm for the best baking results. Ensure there is no pockets of air within the foil and then bind the foil with sellotape. I used to use masking tape for this purpose, but have found sellotape can be bound tighter and that clay adheres better to the gloss finish of the tape. For the sculpting, I'll be using a Montmartre polymer clay press, wooden mini modelling tools, steel clay tools, and of course some Montmartre beige polymer clay. This is the 400 gram block and the Montmartre hobby knife set. I begin by extruding out some fresh clay in the clay press to setting one. The setting can be adjusted by the knob on the opposite side of the handle. I put the clay through the machine a number of times, folding it each time. I then refer to the first image in the PDF and wrap the sheet of clay over the armature. I ensure there is no air between the alfoil and the clay and smooth the clay out as evenly as I can. Where the clay overlaps, I cut away the sheet so it meets fairly cleanly and blend the edges. If you have seen our other realistic sculptures, you would notice that we recommend a shell be first created, then baked, so that a subsequent final detailed layer can be applied. This sculpture, however, is a lot less bulky, so this negates the need for a shell to be first baked, so the body, arms, legs and crest can be taken to a finished stage and then baked. Once the alfoil is encapsulated, I start to add muscle tone and give indications of underlying skeletal elements. To create a seamless blend, I add the clay and use a round tool and roll the body over the join. I then add clay over the armature part of the legs. I ensure there is no air between the armature and the clay and cut away the excess. Then clay can be added in the appropriate areas. Even though Quetzalcoatlus was a massive animal, his limbs were still fairly slight. In fact, the bones were hollow with very thin walls, like bird's bones, strengthened by internal struts. They would have had very minimal subcutaneous fat, so muscular form would be very apparent. Whilst Quetzalcoatlus was massive, there were pterosaurs that were very small, like Namicoloctarus. He was the size of a finch. Refer to the reference material and keep refining as you go. Take care to ensure the back legs have a lean to them. If you don't have a banding wheel, you might like to invest in one. The one I'm using in this project is a very affordable plastic wheel and it makes the process a lot easier. I think I've said it in another lesson, polymer clay is a really great medium as it has the ability to be carved as well as to be added to. So building up a model happens quite quickly. Plus, you're not rushed into anything, as you could work on the model for as long as you like. You also don't have to keep it operational like traditional clay that needs to be constantly damp. I make the shoulders fairly pronounced, as there would be a lot of muscle there from having to operate those massive wings. Recently discovered fossil tracks suggest pterosaurs walked on all fours, folding up their wings like umbrellas. As creating a sculpture goes, to show such a stance is a bit of a challenge, but pretty much everything is possible if you have a good armature, and pre-think your steps logically. Now the general shape has been created, I start to put in details like knee bones, muscles and tendons and things, and suggest any long muscles by carving away clay in the unwanted areas. Of course it's hard to know exactly where to place these, or even how they really looked. At the end of the day, when we build a sculpture like this, we are doing it to challenge ourselves. Of course we try to make it as genuine as we can, but we are not scientists, we are just having a bit of fun. 
I want to try something different whenever I create artwork and every project I find new ways to do things. There is always that stage, usually around the middle of the project, where you think, where do I go from here? Like on this project, I had trouble with the legs. I just couldn't get them to look right. When this happens, you just have to persevere. Another tactic is to leave the problem part and move on to something you feel more confident about. I had a look at the skeleton and noted how big the humerus bone was, so made the shoulder bigger and this in turn made the arms look a little more slender. Pack the head area of the armature and then extrude a sheet of clay in setting 3 and wrap it around the head area that will be the crest. Blend it onto the head and then cut it to shape. Refer to the PDF for guidance. Scientists aren't really sure of what pterosaurs use their crests for, but they do have some theories. Species recognition, selection, cooling and steering when in flight are all possible reasons for this strained appendage. Once the shape has been created, squeeze the crest so it looks quite thin. I then use the needle tool to create a series of vertical lines emitting from the head. While we have our needle tool, we create a series of lines to suggest a coat. Apparently pterosaurs had body fibres called cynofibres that looked quite like fur. This has raised the question, were pterosaurs warm blooded? You'll also notice I have shortened my needle tool. This makes it easier to get into tight areas. Remember to follow form with the fur also, as this adds to the realism. Okay, well, I'm happy with that finish. Now it's time to do the first baking. So preheat the oven, follow the instructions on the back of the packaging, and we'll bake this. So I've baked it. There's no cracks. It looks good. I've let it cool. Now we can start the next part. And the next part is to add the phalanges, wing membranes, feet, and Mr. Quetzal Coartalus's handsome head and beak. I extrude some clay on setting two and lay it out onto my cutting board. This board is a sheet of perspex, by the way. I cut the sheet so it has straight edges and a right angle. And I then cut it in half and chamfer each edge. Lay them on top of one another and smooth in the join. This overlap ensures the bond is strong but invisible. Take the sheet and place it behind and between the legs. Ensure the sheet is midway up the belly, press it into position and using the knife lightly profile the area that needs to be kept. Obviously only press very lightly as you don't want the blade to go through the sheet. Remove the sheet onto the cutting board and cut the marked profile lines. Chamfer the edges as this gives a wider surface area to apply it to the model. Carefully place the clay into position and gently press it onto the legs. This is actually a very simple way to suggest the wings, but it would be more problematic had the legs and body not been baked. Blend the clay onto the legs so the join is neat. Cut away any excess clay and roll it smooth. I like to use the stiff brush for the final smoothing. The part of the wing that folds up and is connected to the end of the wing is called the phalange. Create a tapered tube and stick a length of tie wire up through it. Then thread it onto the length of tie wire from the armature. Smooth the tube onto the base of the arm and then whittle the tube down so it's more size appropriate. It is easier to fashion it larger and thin it as it's easy to distort the clay while threading a thin tube onto the wire. Next, take another extruded sheet and fasten it to the finished phalange. Press it on and then smooth the join. The bond of wet clay to wet clay is quite tenacious. Once the sheet has been applied, you can smooth it in. Join it up with that brush. I'm always surprised at how well clay bonds. And that bond seems to get stronger the longer they are in contact. Cut the wingtip to size and make any necessary adjustments. Connect the bottom of the membranes together and smooth the join so it's basically invisible. Then cut the bottom of the main part of the wing at the correct angle. Next we can create the feet. I find it easiest to roughly fashion the shape and slowly refine it all. It doesn't matter what animal you're sculpting, the feet are always a challenge and it can be a frustrating job to get them right. You also have to take into account the weight that is on them and if the animal's stance has a bearing on their position. 
The toes or metatarsals are tubular obviously so that's a good starting point. The digits on the front wing splay out to the side so I create a rough shape and get them to sit correctly then refine them. To be honest Quetzalcoatlus's metacarpal one was perhaps slightly shorter but their digits are largely unknown. I create the talon by cutting the end off the digit, compressing the clay and reapplying it and again refine until it sits correctly. Quetzalcoatlus had evolved wing membranes from the coccyx to the ankle called the uropatagium on both sides. These would have created more surface area and aided in gliding and stabilisation and can be applied in the same way as the wing membranes. There has been theories that Quetzalcoatlus would be unable to take off from the ground unassisted and would have had to have launched themselves from say a cliff and was really more of a glider but of course we'll never know. Once the wing is adhered cut it to shape. Of course these wing membranes are not really to scale as to make them so would mean they would have to be about 0.1 of a mil thick. Sometimes you've got to make practical compromises with sculpture. There is also a small membrane from the scapula to the wrist called the propatagium, obviously to add even more wing area. It would be very hard to create these membranes without a clay press. Once you get one you'll wonder how you ever did without it. Extruding the clay through a press is the most effective way to condition the clay. Well conditioned clay is less inclined to crack and easier to manipulate. Now finally time for the head. I always look forward to creating the head and I leave it to the last as a sort of reward for getting through the feet part of the project. I find it to be the culminating stage and really enjoyable. In Quetzalcoatlus's case it's quite simple really especially compared to the other ancient creatures with horns and compound curved shape heads full of teeth and stuff. He really just has a giant beak. So I start by bulking out the head so there is enough clay to carve out a geometric shape. Straight shapes are better to carve than an additional type of sculpting. Think of the skull in side profile and top profile. Lightly mark up the cut lines first before committing to cut and cut out the side shape first. I use a large blade in the hobby knife and pare away the bottom part of the skull and remove the excess as neatly as I can. I don't worry too much about the mess as I can smooth it all obviously. The thing I have to bear in mind is that the skull is very wide from the side profile and very slender from the top. Once the sides have been done follow the same method for the top profile. The beak was quite sharp with no hook at the end like a modern stork. The feeding habits are controversial and scientists have said they think it may have been a scavenger that fed on the dead carcasses of sauropods and other dead dinosaurs. It had no teeth and could have probably hunted small vertebrates on land or in shallow streams also. Once the general shape has been reached I smooth and refine the shape. I soften any hard right angle edges to give it a gentle curve and pay attention to where the head meets the neck. I felt the top bill was too angular so I created a slight concave area by gently carving it away until it looked right. Now we can start to add the details of the face and it's getting really exciting. The eyes on Quetzalcoatlus sat extremely far back on its skull. I marked the eye positioning just with a point. I create a mark to suggest where the top and bottom of the bill meet. I then create a line to separate the top area of the beak around to the eye patch. I finish the curve for the eye patch and then put in the ear hole. Once I've detailed the ear hole I start to model the eye socket. I create a fairly deep crater but keep a hard edge from the front. I then excavate some of the clay from the side of the skull with the flat blade attached. This will suggest the soft fleshy part on the side of our friend's head. If you notice on Quetzalcoatlus's skull there is a large window. This is called the ant orbital fenesta. Some scientists speculate this was covered with a fleshy membrane. I remove some clay to about one millimeters deep and level it all out. Scientists have theorized that this fleshy part of the head could be flushed with blood and change colors to aid in courtships or to show emotion. 
I then use a metal fork tool and add texture to the surface. Little details like this add real interest and the surface facilitates interesting results when paint is added. I add an oval shaped ball into the eye socket and then use the needle tool to add the eyelids. I use my cut off paintbrush handle to create a small crater and then add the eyeball. Suddenly this mass of clay takes on a life. The last step was to add the wattle like thing under the beak and attach it to the neck. I press it into position and smooth it onto the neck. Finally, I blend the skin from the head into the fur. And voila! Well, thanks for watching. You can share your creative projects on social media using hashtag MontmartArt. We look forward to your creations and we'll see you next time.